All right. Well, today's a big day. Maybe, maybe it's killing you to know which way I lean. I say go Chiefs. You can feel about that how you want. But you can get over it because I don't feel that way any other day of the year. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big day for a big game. Looking forward to that. I want to want to say uh, hello to our, our our West Side campus. They they have they're usually their uh, their life group happens. It started happening last week with this transformed uh, series of 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 life group sessions that we're doing together. Uh, normally, it happens on Sunday night. And last night was their first week, and they started saying, you know, next Sunday night we'll meet. We'll, we'll do the life group thing, and the person who's speaking forgot completely about something else happening on Sunday night this week, and so they agreed that they would all meet at, right after church at somebody's house, eat some subs, and, and go through the, the Transform life group together so that they could make it to the game also. So hats off to you folks. Help me greet those people today. We're glad that you're part of our church. Well... As I've explained, you know, last, last, uh, at the, uh, last year, I felt like the Lord was giving me a word for our church, for me. That's the word transformation. I think that 2020 is a year when God wants to bring <clears throat> real change to our lives and to our experience as a church. And uh, I don't know what all that means, but I want, I want everything that God has to give us. And as part of that, we're doing 50 days of transformed together. And so there, there are messages on Sundays. Small groups are meeting and focused on this subject. There are 50 days of devotions for you to be able to do in our, in our transformed guidebook still available uh, in, in the lobby today. Th- these are all, th- we're focused for 50 days on, on being transformed and during this, this series, we're kind of looking at some of the greatest hits of the Bible, if you will. We're looking at the most famous passages in the scriptures. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 23, because we're, we're looking at how to be transformed or how to be more healthy physically. And so don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to give you a Jenny Craig lecture or, or anything like that. We're focused today on the subject of stress. Last year, somebody gave me these long white socks. They, they had like this Jamaican man's face on the, on the side of them, big tube socks that I could pull up to my knee. And they said, too blessed to be stressed. I, I haven't worn them yet. Maybe I should. But <clears throat> the thing is, today we're, we're looking at Stress, and it's related to our physical self, because stress is something that can, can impact your body. When you feel stress, your body feels threatened. It responds with blood, higher blood pressure. It responds with uh, your pulse going up, maybe adrenaline being shot into your body. And it can have all kinds of, of physiological effects on you. Stress can. Stress can also, if you constantly live in stress, One of the things that hundreds of studies have demonstrated is that if you live uh, stressed out, that condition begins to wreak havoc on your brain, on your central nervous system. And in in a real way, stress, chronic stress, can kill you. It's deadly. And so last week in in this Transform series, we, we looked at Spiritual health. This week we're looking at physical health as it's related to stress. Stress comes at us from a number of ways. Here are a few. First of all, you know, worry is a form of stress. If you're constantly like asking yourself what if or you're constantly worrying about your security in some way. Another way that stress comes to us is through hurry. If your life is just kind of like one thing piled on top of another and you are running basically from the moment you wake up until you go to bed, that's not good for you. That increases stress. The third source of stress is crowds. Now, I don't mean crowds like this, although any crowd increases your stress. 
But when we are, when we find ourselves like in the middle of a lot of people, it's something that normally moves stress up. I sometimes have to laugh here in Greater Lafayette. People talk about traffic. The traffic was horrible. And I'm thinking, there's no traffic in this town. I mean, if you're stuck in traffic for 10 minutes, boy, that was, that was really rough. You know, I was, I was following a big funeral yesterday. It was very slow. That's the worst the traffic gets around here, honestly. But if you're stuck in traffic a lot, if you're, if you're you know, constantly waiting in lines and you're, you're trapped in a crowd, that's a source of increased stress. Another source of stress in your life is all the multiple choices that we have. I remember when I was a kid, there were like, <clears throat> there was Crest and Colgate. Okay, that was it. Today, it's like going to the, you go into Walmart, it's like, it's like 60, 60 different kinds of toothpaste, whitening. Uh, the latest I saw, there's the whitening, non-whitening, so on. The latest I saw was gum detoxifying. I'm like, I hope I don't have any toxins in my gums. But multiple choices, it, it, just, it just increases some, some stress in our lives. Number five, another thing that I think of is a loss of privacy. <clears throat> I don't know if you've had that experience. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm a little bit paranoid. But you know, I'll be talking about something maybe I'm interested in, just asking somebody else a question or something, and all of a sudden I go on my phone and I'm online, and what do you know? There's an ad for the exact thing that I was talking about. And it's like, I don't even need to wear Depends yet at this point in my life. How, how does it know? And you become aware in all kinds of ways that you're losing, you're losing your privacy. That's, that, that increases your stress. Number six, pluralism. You know, one of the great things about America is that in the last 50 years, we have become a much more pluralistic nation. So we have people who have all different kinds of points of view and who come from different cultures and who think very differently from, from everyone else. And, and on the one hand, that's a, wonderful, uh, that's a wonderful possibility in America. I know you think it is. But on the other hand, what it results in is that when there are more perspectives that get introduced to us, we become aware that Everyone else may be thinking, no, no we, can, we can't find anybody else basically who shares our values or who thinks like we do. That, that brings an increase in stress. That brings an increase in stress because there's an increase in conflict. Number seven, another, another point that brings us more stress is fear of the future. Fear of the future. So like, what do I mean by this is that, is that if you are constantly uh, looking for bad news in the future... Maybe you're checking the news multiple times a day to just see how close that coronavirus is to you. That increases stress. Things like that increase stress when we have an increased fear of the future. And, and what is great about the passage we're looking at today, maybe you've never thought of it this way, but it contains, it's only six verses long, but it contains antidotes to all these sources of stress. So let's look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. And this, this entire psalm is, a, is an extended metaphor of the idea that God is your shepherd. He's the one leading you in life. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, valley of the shadow of death, right? I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You want to be healthy? You want to have a, a, a handle on your stress? I want to suggest to you, this, this has got the answers to those issues. And uh, I, I know you want to be healthier, and you know, peace of mind 
makes us healthy. How do I know that? Look at Psalm 1430. It says, peace of mind makes the body healthy. Look at another translation. A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. Your life is going to feel better and last longer if you can somehow relax, if you can somehow have peace of mind. And so what are seven spiritual habits that reduce stress? That's what I want to talk about. Number one, it's to look to God to meet my needs. One of the things that, 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 that makes us stressed out is that we are depending on other people to meet our needs. And, and here in this passage, it all begins with the Lord as my shepherd. He's the one guiding me. He's the one protecting me. He's the one meeting my needs. But too many of us, we, we look to other people to meet our needs. I want to suggest to you, if you'd stop looking to your husband, to your wife, to meet your needs... If you'd stop looking to your friends, if you'd stop looking to your boss to meet your needs, you're going to have more peace because, because what you're doing ultimately, you're, you're putting your trust in things that you can lose. Some people, they, they put their security in their marriage. And then their spouse dies or they go through the tragedy of divorce. And then they ask themselves, well, who am I now? What's my identity? How am I going to solve this? Some people put all their security in their money. There are a lot of ways to lose your money. As your pastor and your friend, I just want to recommend to you today that you never put your security in anything that can be taken away from you. You should always put your security and find your security from something that's never going to be taken from you, and that's your relationship with Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I don't need anything. That's what I can always count on. I love how Romans 8.32 says it. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God wants to provide us with all things. But when we put our focus on people or sources that can't do that, it will increase our sense of stress. Second, a second habit to reduce stress in your life is that I need to obey God's instruction about rest. I need to obey God's instruction about rest. So, so much of the stress in your life, it comes from being in a hurry and always working too much, always feeling like you have too much to do. And, and here's the thing. You may feel like you're never going to catch up. But I'll say this to you. You certainly will never catch up if you never get rest. If God wanted... wanted if God might have wanted to, he could have made us so that we didn't need sleep. He could have made it so that we could be awake all day long, every day, and never need rest. But instead, he made us so that we would have to rest. He made us in, in this way so that we could follow his example. He rested on the seventh day, right? He made everything there was in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. God is giving us an example that he wants for us to follow. Now, the Bible is filled with instructions about rest and relaxation and recreation. And, in fact, the Bible, the, the Bible says it like this in, in Exodus 34, 21. It says, Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest you must rest. Even if you're like a tax person, tax preparer, and it's April, you're supposed to take a rest. Even in the busiest times of the year, if you work in retail and it's Christmas time, you're supposed to take some time to rest. Notice what Psalm 
23.2 said, it said, he makes me lie down. He makes me lie down. He makes me to rest. He makes me to take it easy. And, and the thing is, sheep are not smart enough to lay down and rest when they get quite tired. So the shepherd makes them lie down. And that's how it is for many of us. So getting enough rest, it's essential to stress management. But you could say it like this, that your best requires rest. If you're, gonna, if you're really going to achieve the most that you can out of your life, it requires you to rest. It requires a Sabbath. And what do you do on a Sabbath? I want to suggest you, you do three things on a Sabbath. First of all, you, you rest your body. So you need to take a nap. And so there you go. There's the justification for that Sunday afternoon nap. Just don't take it right now. You know? And, 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 and so rest your body. But secondly, a Sabbath, taking a day off, this should be a time when you refocus your spirit. So I rest my body and I, I refocus my spirit. How do I do that? I do that through worship. I do that through connecting with God. Something else that happens or should happen on a Sabbath is that you recharge your emotions. Doing what you normally do, interacting with people in the ways that you normally do, living as you do, doing the job that you do, it, all, it takes emotion from you. The Sabbath is a time for you to, to, to rest and to recharge your emotions. My Sabbath it's not Sunday. Sunday is a work day for me. Often Saturday is a work day for me. So my Sabbath is a Sunday. Or, I'm sorry, my Sabbath is a Friday. <laughs> my Sabbath is a Friday, but it doesn't matter what day it is. The point is that one day out of seven, you, you're going you're gonna to take it as a slow, restful day. Now, you, you might say, well, I feel guilty if I rest. Jesus didn't feel guilty for resting. We find in the Gospels over and over, he's resting. After he does a lot of ministry, he takes some time to go apart. He says to his disciples, come apart with me. You could say that they, they came apart so they didn't come apart, you know? I remember uh, there have been a couple times in my ministry where uh, people didn't understand what a pastor did. Some, some thought, you know, I just worked on Sunday or whatever, and or, or like, you know, they just didn't understand how my life was. And they, I've had people say to me, I heard you take off Friday. And they'll say, yeah. And they'll say, well, I want you to know the devil doesn't take off Friday. And I'm thinking to myself, you want your pastor to be like the devil? You know, you're <laughs> kind of confused. Yeah. Listen, some of you, you're, you're emotionally frayed, and it's because you're not getting rest. Some of you, stress is what keeps you awake at night and during the day. You need to rest. It's a key in, 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 in managing stress. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. Third, something you can do to manage stress is to reach hold Recharge your soul with beauty. Beauty is an incredibly important thing in managing your stress because there's so much ugliness in life and difficulty in life. And this can happen in different ways. Maybe it happens because you go outside. Maybe it happens because you, uh, you, you put some art in your life. I don't know. Remember what it said, though. It says, he makes me lie down. He, he leads me beside the still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He goes, takes me to beautiful places. This last fall, Tracy and I, we went to uh, Montana together to Glacier National Park. And we, we enjoyed beautiful things there. I just want to show you a picture of, of just one of the things we saw. This was a, a stream. It was so loud. All these waters, you could hear them roaring by. And, and, and of course, the, 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 the mountains were just beautiful. And it was like, it was like, I wish that I, I could show you a picture of Tracy. She was just, she was just beaming with 
happiness and, and joy, just, just being there and seeing all this, it's because the beauty that God made is meant to restore and recharge us. What are some things that you can do to recharge your life in this way? Well, number one, get outside every day. If you're basically inside most of the time, you're, you're going to begin, your, your world just begins to kind of shrink on itself. And secondly, start the day, start the day with God, not media. So don't go to the internet, don't go to social media, don't turn on the TV, don't check your text messages or your email, but instead, spend the beginning of the day with God. It will, it will make your day different. Maybe you need to turn on some worship music and just spend like, I'm not talking about hours, I'm saying spend the first five, ten minutes of your day just in God's presence, connecting with God. That's going to help you start your day and end your day so much differently if you'll take that step. A fourth thing to do to manage stress, a spiritual habit, is to go to God for guidance Right, this, the, the, the psalm said, he leads me in right paths for his namesake. One of the common sources of stress for a lot of people is indecision. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what decision you should be making. You have multiple options and you just can't decide. And the stress grows the longer that there's uncertainty. I want to I recommend to you today that you make God the number one source for guidance and opinion in your life. Some of us, we, we, we depend on friends or our spouse or somebody we look up to. We ask them first what their opinion is, what kind of, we ask them first for guidance. And I want to suggest to you, the Lord is the, is the best first source for you to go to. When you need, when you need guidance, look how James 1.5 says it. Because if any of us lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So God's not going to be saying, what, what do you mean? You can't, I'm not going to help you with that. You can't figure that out. That's not the way God is. He generously and graciously is willing to give us wisdom. And so you come to God and you say, God, I need wisdom. And then you also, you look in God's word and you say, God, how, what are you saying to me about X, Y, Z? And you look at the Bible and you say, God, speak to me through these words. That's how you get wisdom. That's the best path to take when you need guidance. And that will help you to, to lower and manage your stress. Number five, a, a habit you can do to, to manage stress in your life is to trust God in the dark valleys. Remember he said, he said, even though I, I pass through the darkest valleys, valley of the shadow of death, we all go through dark valleys in our lives, multiple times in our lives. One of the, one of the common sources of stress in your life is loss. You can lose your job, you can lose your income, you can lose a friend. You can lose your money. You can lose your health. You can lose your reputation. You can lose a loved one. We all go through these multiple uh, seasons of loss in our lives. And when you go through loss, usually there are like two different ways that we respond. The first is that, that, that we are filled with fear when we lose. We're, we're afraid of what's going to happen. We're afraid that our lives are never going to be the same. We're afraid that we're never going to make it through. There's all kinds of ways that we fear. And we fear our emotions. Many of us, we, we deal with loss through, we be, by, by suppressing and holding back our emotions. When we lose something, God gives us this gift of grief. It's a gift because that's the way that we process through significant loss. Maybe you're dealing with a significant loss today. And, and you've kept telling yourself that if you'll just hold on, you'll be better. And I'll just say to you that 
that's not the way to approach that problem. If you can figure out how to grieve about it, how to cry about it, how to feel the wound deeply, you will be able to cross through that tunnel you're in a whole lot quicker. You know, too many of us, we just stuff it. We stuff it when we're dealing with loss. But God invites us to let it out. Not once in the Bible does it say, grieve not. It doesn't say, sorrow not. It doesn't say, weep not or cry not. But God says, 365 times in the Bible, God says, fear not. What's that tell you? It's okay to feel sad, even to feel sad for a long time. But you don't need to fear. Because the Lord is with you. Grief doesn't paralyze. Fear paralyzes us. Some of you, you're going through the valley of some dark shadow right now. Maybe it's the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe like it's your death that's impending. Or maybe it's someone that you love very much. It may be the valley of the shadow of debt or the valley of the shadow of conflict, or it may be the valley of the shadow of depression or discouragement. But you find yourself in a valley of a dark shadow. And I just want to remind you of a couple things today. I remember when I was a little boy, uh, we lived on this particular street, and occasionally as I was laying in bed and I was going to sleep, you know, cars would pass by and the light would pass through the windows in a certain way, and I would see big things on my wall, and I would feel afraid. And you know what I learned eventually? I learned eventually that there's no threat from a shadow. Shadows really can't hurt you. Shadows, they are, they are big, but there's no substance to them. Shadows aren't really going to hurt you but what you can always remember with a shadow is, even when the darkest shadows visit your life, is there's a light that makes the shadow possible. There's a light that's brighter and bigger than the, than the disappointments that we're facing. And today, today I, I just want to encourage you to remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He's your light in the darkest valley. He invites you not to fear in the darkest valley because he's with you. I love it how David said it in Psalm 142, verse 3. He says, when my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. Even when you feel like you just can't go on, even when you feel like you're overwhelmed and you're never going to get past this thing, God's watching over your way. I want you to write something down right now. You can write it down on your outline or somewhere else. It's this, I don't have to know the answers when I know God. I don't have to know the answers when I know God. You don't have to know why something's happened. You don't have to know you don't know, have to know why you're, you're going through what you're going through or why it happened. Instead, you need to remember the who. Who is with you? That will reduce stress a lot. Something else David shows us in this 23rd Psalm, a sixth habit to reduce stress is to let God be my defender. Let God be the mighty offender. In, in Psalm 23, 5, David writes, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You know, one of the common sources of stress in our lives is conflict. Opposition, criticism, attacks. And there are people in your life who, who simply don't like you. Maybe you work with them. Maybe they're 
Maybe there are people in your own family who won't let you enjoy anything. Or people who constantly minimize any success that you enjoy. You've had people in your life like this and they're always attacking you. They're always putting you down. And when that happens, your natural response is to attack back, to retaliate, to get even. But if you get even, you're, you're really no better than they are. I was talking earlier about, earlier about uh, polarization, pluralization in our society. Constantly being around people who don't agree with us in some way. Maybe they don't agree with what you, what you like. Maybe they don't agree with what you believe in. Maybe they see the world in such a different way. And as a result, this leads to them criticizing you. There are other reasons for this, of course. And we see it m most brightly in our, in our political life in America. There's such an intense polarization that's happening because of how people look at things differently. And you see it, you see it also online. Post an opinion about almost anything. And, and it doesn't even have to be like, it doesn't even have to be like uh, uh, controversial. Post an opinion about anything on Facebook, and uh, if, you, if you touch religion, if you touch politics, if you touch, um, what's something else that'll get you shot? But you post something on there, an opinion, and automatically people, people will very often, they'll just like jump to attack what's been said. Such drama going on in people's lives. It, it goes beyond what's going on in Facebook. It has to do with what's going on in our heart. It has to do with, with being stressed out with, with the way that we are constantly with people all the time who think exactly opposite and live exactly opposite to what we, we think or do. How do you handle rude people? How do you handle it when people are mean? David gives us the picture. He, he gives us the picture in that he lets, he lets God take care of it. He's been, he's been, he says, you anoint my head with oil, meaning you, you picked me to be your king. You, you picked me to be uh, your chosen one. And in the context of that, I'm going to let you set a table before me. I'm going to let my cup overflow. I'm not going to worry about the people who are against me. I'm going to let you be my defender. I love how David says it in Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. What, what's David wanting us to understand here? It's that God is his defender. And you know what? God's your defender too. If you'll let God be your defender, if you won't worry about how to figure out how to make a comeback or how to like get back at the person who's hurt you or disappointed you, and instead let God be your defender, you're going to find more peace in your life. But that takes humility. It takes humility for us not to attack back and to let God be our defender. A seventh spiritual habit that we find here is to expect God to finish what he starts in me. How does, how does David say this? In Psalm 23, 6, it says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, so part of what's going on is that I need to expect, if I'm going to find peace, if I'm not going to increase my stress. I'm going to recognize God has a good place that he's taking me. God has good plans for me. God has good promises for me. He, he intends to take me someplace good. I'm going to dwell in his house forever. And right now, what's following me is goodness and love. Now, when you think about that, goodness and love, how does that fit into the shepherd? You know, the shepherd stays in front of the flock. The shepherd leads the flock. But in the following behind the flock, usually a shepherd has some sheepdogs. 
And the sheepdogs are making sure that the whole flock stays together and, and moves along and keeps in the path. And I would say that in your life, regardless of wh what you feel is going on, if you, if you follow Jesus Christ, part of what's following your life are two sheepdogs, their, their love and goodness. And because of that, you can be sure that God is going to complete in a positive way what what he wants to do and to accomplish through your life. What Psalm 23 asks us to do is to take on God's viewpoint of our lives. Take on, take on a viewpoint that lets him be our provider, lets him be our protector, lets him be the one who's with us at the most difficult times. Let him be the source of of the very best blessings that we receive. The way that you lower stress is to expect that God will finish what he's starting. Even if everything goes wrong, God is going to straighten it out. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. 